Well, good morning, everyone. If, if you are visiting this morning, and some are, it's lovely to see you. <laughs> um, we're working through a, a, a series, which is very flexible and very interesting, on enjoying kingdom. So much in church life we may not have particularly enjoyed. We may not. Or we may, I don't know. Or the sum and sum, that's usually the case, isn't it? But Jesus clearly wanted our focus to be on his kingdom. And that emphasis is given in the Gospels, it's given in the Acts, it's given in the letters. And it's obvious that he wants us to enjoy that kingdom. He says the kingdom of God isn't a matter of rules and regs, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So it, it's clear that he has for us an enjoyment of kingdom. So we just put out a little uh, circle with segments on it, and we're just working our way around the circle. We've done various bits. I say done them, we're sort of working through them as best we can, and w- the rest of our lives will be a working through them. But repentance and faith... We looked at to begin with. And it's not that repentance is a one-off. It's ongoing for all of us. I should think some of us had cause to bring our repentance before God this morning as we worshipped and shared in communion together. It's an ongoing thing. And it, it always amuses me when people seem to think that repentance is heavy. Do you think that? Oh, it's heavy, you know. We shouldn't be repentant. Come on, friends. It's the kindness of God. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. When I repent, I think at least God's still on my case. You know, He's still working with me. He's still got things to do in me. I, I'm, I'm quite glad about it, really. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And it's my pride that stops me from doing it very often. It's the best thing that ever happened to us, living a life, repentance. Somebody wrote a book, Repentance, the Joy-Filled Life. (laughs) So, there you go. Repentance and faith. Forgiveness and healing, we've looked at. Salt and light, we've looked at. Giving and receiving, we've looked at. Prayer and fasting, and we've done a whole series of weeks on that. And I actually made a little beginning on, uh, on Thursday. Um, and we did have a, just a few people meet as we just began a day of prayer and fasting on Thursday rolling into Friday, which we may have broken for a meal on Friday evening. I was going to fast Friday, but um, Danny invited me out for lunch and I forgot about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, but nevertheless, it, it, it's... it's It's got into my spirit. I know, I know, I know, I know. (laughs) He rang and said, come out for lunch on Friday. And I said, because I'd go out for lunch when he invites me. I said, yeah, of course I will. And I then put the phone, I'm fasting tomorrow. (laughs) But there you go. The Lord is is incredibly gracious. He's fantastically gracious. Perhaps I'll make up for it next week, you know. Prayer and fasting. It's lovely. And fasting is a grace. It's, it's not somebody going doing like this. You've got to miss all that food. You know. it, no, it's a grace. I don't deserve to fast. God gives it to me as a grace. And you get blessed in the doing of it. You get anointing by doing it. Anointing. And it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. You know that, don't you? The anointing breaks the yoke. You shouldn't have sat there, John. <laughs> I always remember, I always remember. In the first couple of three years, couple of years probably, that I was here. We used to have fifth Sunday meetings for churches together on Sunday evenings. And the first one we hosted here, um, and of course we get we got a number of people from 14 congregations, and we're packed out, packed out. And I was I was in a bit of trouble trying to, I was preaching and trying to think I'm not really getting through to these people here. And all of a sudden, he and, he and Andrew were sitting on the front row where he's sitting now. 
And halfway through, the camp walked out. And I said, I've shared this with him, he remembers it. I said, don't worry about them, they always walk out in my sermons. <laughs> and from that moment in time, I'd got him. I'd got him. And then about ten minutes later, they came back and sat down again at the same places. I said, you missed the best bit. I tell you, I couldn't have paid him to, to, to do me a better service. <laughs> Fantastic. And by then, the, the folks were like, they were rapt attention. It was, it Great, was. you sit there, John, you keep sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, rent a crowd, that's what we want, eh? <laughs> so I'm going to speak... It's, You know, the Spirit leads, doesn't he? Love and good deeds. And he just led me into that text from the way we'd worship this morning. Now, something else. I'm going to test you. Don't put this on the screen, Rob. If you're really attentive this morning. Billy Graham, memory verse. I remember doing a bit of counselling once. once, You know, one of those Billy Graham missions. And they give you some memory scriptures so you can share them with the people who come forward once they're into the sort of counselling room. And one of them is Ephesians... 2 verse 8, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, this not of yourselves, it's the gift of God so that no one can boast. You know, memorize it, get it in your spirit so that you can share. It's got nothing to do with you tonight in the sense that you can do anything, it's by grace that you've been saved and God's lavishing his grace on you now. Grace you've been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Now what is the verse that follows that? Now I'm asking you because it's been read out this morning. (laughs) Oh, look at this, look at this. Amen. Oh, good job you came, Maureen. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do those good works which he prepared in advance for us. To do. Now, the New Testament recognizes for believers two types of work. For believers, we're talking about. One is good works. He's prepared for us good works um, that he's prepared in advance for us to do. And the other is, any idea? I mean, it's not bad, it's not bad works. Yeah, yeah, you said dead. Who said dead? He just said dead. Brilliant. Good works and dead works. <coughs> which, can, you see, the difference is good works, I will do selflessly. I will do as a result of the prompting of God, Holy Spirit within me, and they will bear fruit in eternity. They will bear fruit. And that's the good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. The dead works are the works I'll do with self-concern, selfishly. I'm under pressure. I'm expected to do this. If I don't, you know, I'm doing it to solve my own conscience. Whatever it is that is done with self-concern. And it's not so much God's will, but my will. Perhaps to solve my own conscience. Whatever the motive is. But because self is engaged and involved, they can't produce that eternal fruit which the good works can do. The writer to Hebrews talks about dead works. He says the only thing we can do about dead works is to repent of them. Now, I'll just, I'll just start in sketching out a bit of paper. And, yeah, I've got a penny. What do you think the difference is between good works and dead works? Yes, in principle, I've just said. But are there some works which are definitely good and some works which are definitely dead? Do you think? Give me an example, anybody, of a good work. Something you would think of as a good work. Feed the hungry. Feed the hungry, okay. Any, any others, any other efforts? A good work. 
Prayer is not so much a good work. It, it, it will flow from prayer. So prayer is a motivator. But I think it's true to say that prayer isn't a good work as such. It leads to them. Um, but it's not the whole scenario. In fact, it's, it's an introductory scenario, if you like, where the Lord will give us direction to engage in something, to do something. That's my feeling. Yes, sorry. Mm, okay, yeah, okay. Could you... It comes in many forms, doesn't it? I mean, uh, we can visit the sick, you know. Yeah, yeah, visiting, visiting the sick, yeah, that's lovely. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good scriptural one. Orphans, widows, religion that God esteems, orphans and widows. Is, is that... Uh, Are you saying that's a good work? No, no, that's not. I'm going to go from the other one. All right. You're thinking, I'm going good works right now. Okay. So, so are you in your thinking putting raising money as a dead work? It can be a dead work, but it's not done in the spirit. Ah, well, that's an important point. That's an important point. I put raising money, which it's a grey area, isn't it? Sorry, somebody else? Sharing. Sharing, giving. I mean, one thing I looked at, you know, biblically, was the Good Samaritan. That's a beautiful example of a good work. We we looked at it, the passage, last week. We just skimmed through it. But it's a beautiful example. We talked about, you know, the, um, what's known as the Shema, the, um, in the Hebrew, the, um, hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Soul, mind, spirit, but it also, you know, as the New Testament sums up, love your neighbor as yourself. And the Ten Commandments sum up those two things, don't they, in, in, in greater detail. But, of course, the Good Samaritan was given by Jesus as an example to the teacher of the law who was saying, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus said, this Samaritan, well, this Samaritan is going to give you an example as to how to really reach out to your neighbor who is the man in need. That, that, that's really a, a superb example that Jesus gives of a good deed, reaching out in practical ways to those who are in crises at one level or another. Um, and, and inconveniencing oneself to do that. I admit, I need, I've got a schedule and I'm under pressure, you know, and, uh, well, he's, I haven't really got time. And it challenges me greatly. You know, it... I'm a priest, I'm a Levite, I've got other things to do. Somebody else can deal with that. <laughs> Pastor, hear the word of God. You know, how much are we willing to be inconvenienced when the spirit said, I want you to deal with that one. But uh, I've got all this stuff, I've got to prepare a talk for Sunday, you know, I can't, I haven't got time. I tell you, that's a biggie. Because it was, it was the whole emphasis of much of the prophetic writing. You know, what Hosea said. Hosea, you know, um, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Sacrifice really means for us ritual. Going through the motions, religious observations. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. An acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. The burnt offerings today find their equivalent in much that we do in way of ritual. And the time that goes into it, the, the energy that goes into it, ritual. Whereas God says, I just want mercy. Good Samaritan, just show mercy. Challenging, it's lovely. We need challenge, don't we? I get stimulated by challenge, don't you? So that... The interesting thing is this, you see, but the point I'm trying to get across, that we can easily think of good deeds as being something we can aspire to and get on and do them, and dead, dead work, something we need to walk away from, but much that is like, a bit like the, your money-raising thing, it can be done in the spirit. And if it's done with the right heart, 
all sorts of things which are common tasks which might not seem to be much in the world's estimation become good works as far as the Spirit of God is concerned. He's not got a list of all good things and and dead things that we've we've got to swat up on. He's not actually got that list. He's just got a new heart for us that enables us to do everything that we're doing before no matter how routine or mundane, but with a different spirit. I remember when I came to the Lord, and you know I was in my mid-30s when that happened. Went forward in a mission, you know, and I was just doing a, I was a professional musician at that time, and I was getting lousy work. I mean, lousy work, not very much. The money was lousy. I was cheesed off, you know, really. And 25, when I was 10 years before that, I was a relatively successful man. And at 35, my life had fallen apart. And I was pretty cheesed off with it. And going forward in that mission didn't radically change my attitude. Until I got filled with the Spirit, which was another two years after that. But I remember one thing I did do when I went forward to that mission. I got hold of this Bible and I started reading it. And I would have given anything to have been in a different situation. I like that song we sometimes sing, the other man's grass is always greener, you know. Um, The sun shines brighter on the other side. You know, it was a bit like that for me at that time. I was sorry for myself. Even though I had made that step forward and committed to Jesus. And I wanted to change. I can't really do God's will properly here, you know. I'm frustrated. I want to change. Ever felt like that way? I need a change. I can't do God's will here because they're all getting in my way. You know, have you ever felt that? And I read in 1 Corinthians 7. Everyone should remain in the same position he was in when God called him. Wow. <laughs> and I thought, I need to yield to God in this situation before he makes a way out for me. Even if he doesn't make a way out for me, find God where we are. And that's a vital principle. Find God where we are, because he can't move somebody on who hasn't found God where he is. And even if you do make a change, you take all your own stuff with you. I mean, we see that in church life. People come along, get disillusioned, hive off, thinking they're going to find something better somewhere else. Well, God bless them. I hope they do. But they've got to take themselves. And all that God is after, to transform all the dead works we did before into all the live works and good works we're going to do now, all that he's after is a change of heart. And all the stuff I was doing before begins to come alive in the power of the Spirit. It doesn't matter how mundane, how routine, whatever it is. They are the good works that God has prepared in advance for me to do. Aren't they? What do you reckon? Are you all right with that? Good, good. Yeah. So so it was just that exercise, really, that it's not a list of good works and dead works. It's transforming all those dead works which become alive in the power of the Spirit. I mean, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. When I think the Spirit is honoring that. And of course, this lovely scripture we've just read, uh, as we shared in communion, that's the word, really, for me, that comes up out of this morning's service. Because we can enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way and all of that. Paul talked about it in Ephesians, as being seated with Christ in heavenly places. And in a leadership meeting just a few weeks ago, we referred to that superb Watchman Knee booklet, Sit, Walk, Stand, which is his exposition of the letter to the Ephesians. You sit with Christ in heavenly realms. From that seated place, you walk, you walk of faith that God has for you, and Paul talks about that in chapter 5, walk in love, and then enumerates all the, his his, his directive in the way that we can do that. 
And then we stand against all the wiles of the enemy. Chapter 6, and you know, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against every principality and power in the heavenly realms, in those heavenly realms where the satanic forces operate. And we, yeah, we've got to fight on. But if we sit, and then we walk, and when we stand, the enemy is confused. Because you know that was true in the Old Testament. It's true today. When God moves, he confuses the enemy. And that's good news, isn't it? So he says, we can enter here, the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, right into the throne of grace. We have a great high priest over the house of God. That's all that that wonderful hymn we sang is all about. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, full assurance of faith. Hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Bodies washed with pure water. Doesn't mean we come perfectly, but it means we understand that Jesus sprinkles us with his blood to cleanse us. And all aspects of a guilty conscience can go as we are cleansed in his wonderful presence and share in his body and blood, which is an organic sharing into his very being. It's fantastic, isn't it? Fantastic. Let us hold on unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And that's my heading for this morning's talk. Love and good deeds. Love and good deeds. And I think we are doing that. There's room for more, of course there is. That's why we're seeking God for more. But I think I'm blessed, I'm fully encouraged by the way we are doing that. We're spurring one another on towards love and good deeds. All the dead stuff, forget it. We're coming alive in the power of God's spirit. And he will lead us to do those things which are exponential in the things of his kingdom. That means they multiply and multiply without us knowing even what's going on. A bit like that sower who sowed the, sowed the stuff into the ground and he didn't know how it was going to grow. He didn't know. But he sowed anyway. It's going to grow, friends. Love and good deeds. So I, I, I'm going to look at righteousness, peace, and joy. God, my circle's gone funny. Um, <laughs> righteousness, peace, and joy. Gentleness and humility. Understanding of fruitfulness. I've got a good looking guy at the back who's on that video who's going to do understanding of fruitfulness for me. And then I've got two ladies lined up for power and authority. It takes the ladies to talk about power and authority. And if I'm not happy with what they say, I'll have a shout myself. <laughs> So that's our little circle we're working around. Just to prove to you, we are working sequentially here. We, we sort of know what we're doing. Do we? Do we, John? Yeah. <laughs> we do. He says yes. He says yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your gracious presence this morning. We thank you, Father, for each other. None of it is possible, Lord, but that you draw men and women. Uh, boys and girls to a place of living faith we commend what um, Hillary and the team are doing out there Lord God and may your hand be upon them we thank you for all of our young people and Lord we thank you that as you as we are drawn into your kingdom as we're drawn to do those good works which you have prepared in advance that we should do that Lord those good works are already fruitful And they will accomplish wonderful things in your kingdom and glory, now and forever. Amen.